we need to have a kinder world, um, a more thoughtful world, and where, where people do ask them the question, you know, what effect am I having on others and the planet? The SDGs provide a really good framework for going in that direction because it's very specific. Um, the golden rule is the motivational principle, but the specifics are in the SDGs. So I think, uh, yeah, great worlds would be that, that the SDGs have been satisfied. <laughs>
I believe it. And, and, and it was, uh, it was almost awe inspiring, I bet, because of the, the wisdoms and just maybe to work on with them and on such a visionary futuristic, uh, type of, uh, a vision that we need to reach and where we need to go. Um, before we get too much into the book, I really want to ask you the, 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 the biggest first question is I want to see if, you've been doing this for a long time and an environmentalist and also uh, in the arts and helping uh, all over the world. Has any of that given you some resilience and maybe could you give me an update of how you've been during this crazy time of the pandemic? How, how have you weathered and are you okay? And, and what, what learnings or things have bubbled to the surface for you? Well, you're sweet to ask that question and, and to care. Um, I will assure you that I've been actually very good during it. I, I, Paul and I, my husband and I are at a, a good stage in our lives because uh, our children are grown up and um, he's retired. Uh, so the work that we do continues um, without having to worry about uh, maintaining a family. Um, so that's a big, a big relief, and we empathize totally with all of the people that have been suffering so much uh, financially, but of course, loss of lives and the long, this long, what they call now long COVID, people who continue to suffer. We've managed to stay safe, stay, our, our, our entire family has stayed safe. We've been wise and cautious, and um, I think this moment is a great moment to to uh, really understand the importance of the golden rule, just the simple act of wearing a mask. You want to protect yourself, but, but, but then you also want to protect others. So that is totally an, a perfect example of the golden rule. Um, for us as well, uh, we, we were traveling like crazy for so many years and I have to say I had a lot of conflict about that because of the climate and the emissions from the airplanes and we, we had a terrible um, carbon footprint and so be, to, be, to stop traveling was a big um, burden lifted <laughs> and so I, I felt good that I wasn't contributing anymore to that. and. We just really needed a quiet time to to be together, um, and just restore <laughs> our connection with one another. Really, so I know a lot of people have experienced that as well, and, it, and we were able to experience that also. So it was wonderful, and just to stay home um, and the the whole the technology of Zoom was incredibly liberating in a sense because a lot can be done it can get tiresome you have to manage it but uh but it's amazing what can be done in a super efficient way without any carbon emission i was on something this morning uh early this morning uh, with people from hong kong uh oxford and um st gallen in switzerland and at the end of it he said we did this great four day summit without any emissions. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, let's hope that it does help move the world along and the atmosphere along in, in progressing towards a cleaner, cleaner atmosphere. That, that's beautiful to hear. So I, I, I also travel quite a bit and, and obviously not during the pandemic, but uh, before quite a bit. Uh, I don't know as much as as you and Paul uh, all over the world. And I, I started uh, from the example of Al Gore to do carbon offsetting and carbon capturing through one of my companies as well um, and through our uh, offsetting schemes and things. And there's a bunch of different users out there i'm sure you've probably done that as well it's it's, it's not as as good as not flying at all but it's a, a step in the right direction i think a lot of 
companies, airlines, um, uh, even those who are doing events. Uh, when I in 2019 and 2018, I was really adamant about when they would ask me to speak that I would uh, send out send out requirements that um, they have to include some kind of carbon offsetting. And if they didn't do that, that I was going to do that, and that would be uh, then ha have to be incurred by them somehow to to offset that balance to get them thinking in a different direction about the future and about where we need to go. And um, you know, I don't, I don't know if you guys have been doing that for a while as well, or if if that's kind of helped you guys think in a different direction uh, going forward in the future when we do start to travel again. Yes, I, I did add a carbon offsets to my flights. Um, the problem is it's still in the air. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. and I've, I wasn't 100% trusting the system to actually offset it. So uh, the, the best thing is, is not to, but I do recognize I am a very global person. I, I hope to limit my my reach uh, going forward and i certainly am committed to not flying as much as i as i was for sure and i have more time to go in the car take a train i totally love trains um, unfortunately my family spread out and yeah. uh, to stay connected with them i do need to travel and then you know i have friends that's, all over that's so, beautiful yeah I I all I I all I actually um uh, am am not committed to fly less. Actually, I I have family all over the world and friends all over the world, businesses all over the world. Matter of fact, all the different pins on the thing or or some project or event or or a thing I have going on the world, and I I think it would be better to raise the bar a little higher and have those those companies and those airlines uh, not only do carbon offsetting schemes, but think of other means that we can still see our families around the world and be connected for vital meetings or uh, vital things where uh, you, you must be in person. And for me, it's a lot of that is family or business uh, setups. And um, to do it with alternative fuels, you know, hydrogen-based jet fuels or um some new innovations um to get us there and i've seen that emerge as well you know so there's uh, not only airbus has come out with some really wonderful things right now that they're pushing that forward a lot faster than their initial roadmap and we're seeing that shift that now a lot of airlines are saying well the carbon offset is automatically included in your ticket because we feel that's important and that's a way that we can address it and now so i i, I believe that no matter how horrific the pandemic has been, it's, it's kind of shined the mi microscope on a lot of things and a lot of problems have bubbled to the surface that we're just kind of waiting for the future to resolve. But I think if we tackled it a little bit head on and did some proactive things to, to take the step in the right direction, that, that it will happen. Um, because the, I, I was born, and this leads to my next question for you, as a global citizen, my mother was German, my grandfather was Austrian, my father's American, with relatives in Italy and and in and Japan and in um, and Spain. And uh, right from a baby, I was already a global citizen, running around, meeting all these different cultures and all my relatives, um, and uh, had a big carbon footprint in the beginning as well. But um, I need to see my family. And back then there wasn't that technology available. And so now I, I use that technology, but I really want to see my family live. And I think that business and the future of travel, the future of way we do things can be more innovative to think more of the future. Um, I, I don't think we're going to need to get to Star Trek, but I definitely think we need to think of more sustainable innovations that get us there faster. And so that leads me nicely to my next question. Do you consider yourself to be a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world without borders, nations, divisions of humanity, especially? I think it would be amazing to have a world passport <laughs> and not the national ones. We are moving beyond tribal 
of divisions. We live close together and um, I, I kind of envisioned something like during the old days of let's just say the Ottoman Empire where they would uh, they, there would be these urban centers but then this like rural you know emptiness in between and you just they would just have this more open kind of system and um i i uh i think passports uh, nationalities can limit our view um we we are a global world right now and we are facing global problems so we can't yeah we somehow have to work them out globally and the if you have these national barriers then you have to defend your nation's interests whereas there's so much that connects us and unites us and good things but also bad things so we do we do need more collaboration and i think uh, the nation's nation state concept does make that more difficult i would no. love to have an international passport <laughs> yeah I, w I would too I, I have a german and an american passport so um but i i i really believe that and especially the pandemic has shown us this that you know species air water uh, food um the pandemic they're all global citizens they're not holding to any borders or, or divisions that that humanity has created for itself and then this nationalistic uh, thing has really bubbled to the surface awfully in the pandemic. So it's really sad to see that uh, we're all team members, crew members on this spaceship Earth, and we all can put our hand on the steering wheel and guide us to the future that we wish to see. And um, Carl Sagan really said it best, and, and it ties to the book, Imaginal Cells. Um, there is this rising consciousness of feeling that the, the, the world is seen as a single organism and a single organism divided amongst itself is doomed. And basically the, the world, our earth is uh, a bigger single organism made of, of many cells and many systems that uh, if we divide ourselves against each other, we're doomed. We need to collaborate and cooperate in a symbiotic earth with each other to really reach the future. And so I think the golden rule as you discuss it in the book, and as I've heard you say it before, is really a global rule. There's a global uh, philosophy of thinking, uh, treat people and planet how you would like to be treated. And um, it's a very global thing. I, now I have to make a comment, our audible or, or podcast listeners, won't be able to see this, but I'm gonna to try to describe it. We're both wearing our SDG pins, but there's a distinguishment between the two of them. Yours is much cooler. Yours is cooler because it's the SDG ring or pin with the golden circle, the golden uh, rule circle around us. It. It's, it's hard to see on the camera, but that that's one you're wearing, which was uh, uh, something that you did on, on, on the side of the book as well as because you have some advocates for the SDGs, your husband and, and also Johan and, and a few others um, that, and that's very important. And uh, the SDGs envelop the golden rule and that, and, but that golden rule is also, you know, uh, uh, the circle around the SDGs that connects us all to each other. And so I really love your answer and I love how, how you describe that. Um, that I, and I, I want to really get into the book now and could I, get you. Could I yeah. just interrupt? Go ahead. Go ahead. Could I, so, so the reason that we have the golden rules is, is because you, we can't fulfill the SDGs unless we live it. But also going back to your comment about nature and, and the world, I, I think it's worth just dwelling on this for a moment because if, if you look at nature, it is a, a, this incredibly beautiful system that just flows from one to another. And I, I remember when I was visiting South Africa and we went from the West Coast and we drove East and you go through these, these very different um, 
uh, zones of of climate and uh, nature and the soil the amount of water the vegetation and it just flows from one to the other and this this is if you travel across the united states you know you go across the Appalachians and then it flattens out and then you get you know go across the, all the plains and then you go to the Rockies and then you come down and you get to California and all of that and if you just follow the nature it just flows gently they don't have passports and that reading about the sperm whales in um, um, Carl um, no, no, his name is called Becoming Wild. Carl Safina is the author, and it's a beautiful book. But these sperm whales travel great distances, and they just there's no there are no borders in the ocean, even though we've set up fishing territories and all of that. All this idea of these barriers are, are really a human creation, and I, I, I don't know, I think it stems back from. Well, maybe it's separate, but it's similar of in the days of when the Europeans were exploring the world and bringing back species and categorizing them. And, you know, you have all the deciduous trees and you have the conifers and you have this kind of bird and this kind of animal. And there's this obsession with categorization and division. Whereas if you look at the way the Aborigines look at their environment, everything is connected and the, you affect one thing over here and it affects another thing over here and and it's it's one one flowing stream and I, it's um such a different and, and indigenous people when they 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 think of their environment in, in a more holistic way um rather than these categories that divide it's not neatly divided. So I just wanted to throw that in. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so important. And and it's really species don't have borders and, and um we we're divided ourselves in, in so many ways that we really need to see the big picture. I just had uh, Dr. Uh Parag Hanna on my podcast a couple of weeks ago. And he looks at geospatial maps and uh, show the lights at night or show how things work from outer space. But it's basically a, a digital live map of, of how the world is working, you know, ship movements and, and, and all different things. And, and those maps or that view of that big overview effect is very telling that, the, you know, there's also no borders or divisions there. It's, uh, our world functions in a little bit different way. And even though we're 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 in lockdown, but um, uh, agriculture and food basically domesticated human beings. They're st it's still outside and growing and and doing that, but we're locked up in in these human zoos now, and uh, that we've uh, gotten a microscopic view of what our human zoos look like, and and we've heard throughout the world that um, people are pretty unhappy that. Uh, their human zoo wasn't created the way they, they wanted to, and they were going stir crazy and having cabin fever and domestic violence or eating themselves to death. And, and that there was just a lot of other problems bubbling in the surface that says they don't want to be in their human zoo that they've created for themselves for a lockdown for extended periods of times. And it's really important that we realize that um, that these divisions or the way we separate ourselves from each other um, it, it, it plays a big effect on our culture, on our futures, and on, on the way we see and interact with the world. And it's nice to to kind of change that. You mentioned your family and and uh, being you know spread out around. I'm I'm a grandpa, so I have adult children as well. Four adult children, and just had my new grandbaby born for my youngest son um, on October 14th. And they live, um, most of them live in the United States and America. And so I want to go see my grandbabies and hug and kiss them and spoil them a as a grandpa. And um, uh, I, I, I need to travel, but I want to do it in, in a way that doesn't harm humanity and it doesn't harm our environment. And I believe in 
innovation for purpose and ways to do things and ways to, to be global citizens and to, to be part of this planet that doesn't um, go outside of the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries that doesn't need to harm in the same process. And that really, the reason I mention that is because I wanna know if there was like a shift or what led you to become an environmentalist if some of these same thoughts or these same things that the way our, our world is set up or is working that you see that it's really not in harmony with, with, uh, um, with nature or human suffering. Is that, was there any journey or anything kind of an aha moment or something that led you off onto this path? So going back a long way, when I was okay. at the university in the 70s, um, I remember taking a course in wildlife ecology. I grew up out in the country, so I did have a sense of the, the view. I mean, I've always felt really close to nature and needed to be in nature and that. And the wildlife ecology course just really helped me understand the system of it. And of course, traveling around, I experienced many of these different systems. Um, and then, of course, in the there were books coming out at that time. I remember Rachel Carson Carlson's book, um, Silent Spring, and um, Shoemaker was it Shoemaker's book, um, Small is Beautiful. These kinds of things, and uh, unfortunately, these voices got a bit lost in the frenzy of the. 80s and the 90s and the me you know there was this whole emphasis this period of me focus on me and i just could never buy that line because i never felt like i'm alone on this planet I, you know i'm not alone in my family i have to live with other people it's not about me and i always did have the golden rule in my in my heart at some level um that's what i grew up with love Love is, is about thinking about other people. So, um, but then the, the real, the, the thing that really cinched it for me to, to work hard on this golden rule idea was the Laudato Si, the climate uh, encyclical from, from the Pope Francis in 2015. And uh, I loved that book so much. I'm not Catholic, but I love that book. And he, he addresses it to all citizens of the world. And I thought, you know, this message really, really resonated with me that he redefined uh, the word dominion in the Bible, that man has dominion, God gave man dominion over all the earth. That was a phrase that always bothered me. Um, he re, re as, uh, he gives it the new interpretation of stewardship, which is much more appropriate, even though it still means that we're separate, we're like still responsible. Nature can take care of itself. It doesn't need humanity, but it is yeah. definitely a step up from domination. So um, I, so then to me, well, he talks about the golden rule. And uh, then I was asked to participate in this book and help put this book together. And instead of focusing on leadership, <clears throat> we agreed to, to have it revolve around the golden rule. And when I then started looking into the golden rule, I realized, oh my gosh, it's not just Christian. It's, it's the basis of every religion. And in the book, um, since you've got it there in the middle of it are these pages that just pull out a few references throughout history that a historian has been working on uh, for decades and um, I, I love this one which I'll share from the Yoruba people in Nigeria one who is going to take a pointed stick to pinch a baby bird should first try it on himself to feel how it hurts. I love that. That's and beautiful. I think, I think when it, we, we, we have the choice every day to think about if we're going to hurt somebody, if we're going to help somebody. And uh, in our organizations that we work in, in our families, what we say, it's, it's about asking yourself every day what, what you say and what you do and how does it affect others in the planet? 
And I, I can see you thinking carefully about it in, in all of your flights and how are you going to do that going forward in a way that that is helpful rather than hurtful. And that's just one example. But I know you're, you're involved in food. That's a really big question. Yeah, it's a big what one. am I eating? And has it hurt people along the way to get to my mouth? Or has it helped anybody? And so that this is a huge system that needs to be changed. And a lot of people are, are working on that, thank goodness. And um, yeah, it's, it's rooted in, in this simple principle that is so incredibly universal. It is. And that's why I, I find it um, so hard to, to go with that, the thought that not only is it universal, it's global, it's something for us all that we then try to break it down and divide ourselves or fight against this, this nature and, and, you know, went from domination over nature to now stewardship. And I also love the encyclical. I think um, um, it's a very progressive Pope, but also such a beautiful way to, to, to get um, many listeners, many followers to think about things a little bit different and to, to put themselves uh, um, into the picture with <clears throat> with nature and with biodiversity that we're not a dominating species on top of this planet we're actually part of the the ecology of uh, the whole ecosystem of, of this planet and we're an integral part if you uh, you know not only is the name but some of the other things that are described in here that, that I'm going to let you touch upon in a moment so interesting is that we actually have more microbial cells in our body and more microbial genes in our body than we do human cells and human genes. And uh, what that truly means is um, that we have more in common with our planet, with an oak tree, with a squirrel, with other species than, than we do with us as, as human beings as far as cell to cell ratio. And um, we, we uh, no matter what religion or what belief you have, we crawled out of the primordial soup of, of this earth. We are of this earth. We weren't dropped off here by uh, Mars or Venus or any other planet. We, we, we were born here. And uh, uh, another quote from Carl Sagan, which I really like, uh, is we're, we're all made up of star stuff, stardust, you know, and uh, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, <clears throat> uh, calcium. They're all the basic elements of life, but they're also the basic elements of our planet and our earth and how things are made up and, and are. And so if we can get that connectedness, if we can realize the connectedness of us and, and our earth, it just gives you a different view of how to act and how to progress and how to move forward um, uh, without this um, not, not very long-term model or sustainable model. Yeah, uh, it gives you a much better operating system or model. And that's also, you know, when in the beginning I asked you about how have you weathered the pandemic? Have you had some resilience with this type of model you guys have been operating on and thinking about for many years? In, in Germany, um, and you, you're probably well aware of this, they call your husband Green Paul because he's so great with not only the sustainable development goals, but thinking in, a green or sustainable direction. And um, that only occurs with that global or that universal view of the rest of the world because the way things flow in our world are all interconnected. The stuff that occurs in Brazil affects us in Germany and the United Kingdom. The stuff that occurs in the United States affects parts of China and other parts of the world. It's all really interconnected. Um, that leads me to probably before we get too much into the book, uh, uh, even more, I want to ask you the toughest question that I have for you today, and it's the burning question, WTF, now don't be afraid, it's not the swear word, although this year I'm sure many people have been tearing out their hair saying the swear word, it's actually, what's the future? Well, I can't see into a crystal ball, but um, you know, it, it, it depends a little bit. How I feel about the future depends a little bit on 
of how I read the newspaper. If I read it from the front and don't have time to get to the back of it, I get a little bit worried. I get quite worried. If I start at the back, I've discovered that all the really fun articles are at the back. So when I start from the back, I, feel, I don't have time to read the front. <laughs> so then I feel a lot better because the back is always about creative people um, doing wonderful things. And so uh, I, I, I suggest to people that they skip the front and just read the back of it. <laughs> um, but also, I, I also feel hopeful because I do feel this great surge of awareness um, and connection that I think this COVID period has brought. It has created some awful things, but there's such a, I think, I believe very much that good eventually overcomes evil. And I think the goodness that is coming out of this will eventually seep into other things and um, help us in all of the areas. And young people generally have a much higher degree of awareness of, of wanting to live their lives differently than the dream that I grew up with which was to, I mean, I, I'm probably not one of the biggest consumers, but I am a big consumer, I have to admit that. And was is it's clearly not sustainable anymore. And uh, I don't want uh, my generation to feel guilty for what we've done, but because we didn't. It was just a system that we were all born into and a way of life, a way of thinking. And it, it seemed endless. The opportunity seemed endless. So nobody is to be blamed for it, but we do need to fix it. And uh, I encourage young people to, to have a different dream. And I, th I think they do, you know, for the most part. So that makes me feel hopeful. Uh, I think companies themselves are waking up that they should not have built-in redundancies like the, you know, the classic example are printers that I learned from Bill McDonough that uh, they have a chip in them that says after 10,000 copies, they stop working. <laughs> Nothing's really wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these companies have still not figured out, they, they have these sort of recycling things, but you have to pay for it. And it, it, it's, there's, so we, we, that whole model of these, these machines has to change and is changing very slowly. But this takes government working together with manufacturers, working together with, with the consumer organizations to to change that whole model and make it great to repair things, make it possible to repair things rather than cheaper to buy a new one. So these are all the things that that are happening. And the, you talked about new fuel. Uh, there's so many creative people working on all of these things that I think we're going to get there. I do feel positive And of course, with the a change in some of the administrations around the world and leaders that will help a lot. You, you brought up something interesting a couple of times now, systems. So I'm a, I believe strongly in a systems view of life and systems thinking and how uh, systems make up our world and they're all around us. Um, a little bit of complexity science is intermingled in this systems thinking or in systems as well. Uh, what's your version? What's your take? Well, how do you see systems? And um, when when you bring that up, how does that not only tie into your book, but your general philosophies? And, and uh, do we just need a, an add-on or a tweak to our current systems? Or do we need an entirely new system? Uh, uh, kind of want to know your philosophies or thoughts or maybe ideas around that since you brought it up a few times. Well, I think food, uh, the way we produce food is, is probably uh, one of the most crucial systems. 
uh, again, I mean, you, you know much more about it than I do, but uh, I'll just offer a couple of simple ideas. Um, again, farms are individual systems, you know, have been thought of as an individual system, but it's not correct because when you clear the land and you clear the forests and uh, you know, the, 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 particularly the Amazon uh, and the, the, the tropic forests um, in the middle of the earth, if you cut these fragile systems down, they, it has terrible, terrible repercussions and the soil isn't even that good. But let's say the farms where I grew up in the Midwest in the United States, you clear that land and you get these vast, these vast fields of a monoculture, well, all of the native life there is gone. And that has, all of that native life has created that rich soil over so many years. And we are just planting our seeds and exploiting that soil without thinking about how that soil needs to regenerate. So, and then, of course, with all the chemical, then over time, that soil depletes, and then you have to use chemicals to supplement what's been depleted. So and then the problem is that those chemicals are not very precisely put on <laughs> the seeds, and so then it runs off, the excess runs off into the waterways, creates a all kinds of problems in the in the in the in the rivers where it runs in the streams then it gets out into the ocean <laughs> then you get these algae patches that uh, take all the, uh, the the life out of out of it and i mean it, it just is everything is connected and it's been ignored for for decades so that that's just a, a, a one example of a system that's beautiful. I I speak about systems all the time. I just wanted to really hear from you, and that's you. You have I could listen to you uh, all day long because you have a beautiful, very wonderful, uh, gentle voice, and and uh, I thank you for your wisdoms. Can you tell us a little bit more about imaginal cells and maybe your favorite contribution? Um, I'll tell you right now, my favorite is is your introduction. Your what you wrote is my favorite part of it all, and uh, what I enjoyed the most. But uh, do you have a, do you have a favorite or some some things that uh, overarching take away that means the most to you, and what message you're trying to depart to the world? Well, the the very title. I could start with the very title, imaginal cells. Um, they are the cells, just briefly, that hold the vision of the butterfly while this being is a caterpillar. So there's two separate identities, the caterpillar, and this makes a great metaphor for what's going on today and gives hope, actually, in this period of chaos. Um, so the caterpillar gorges and gorges and gorges during his life and consumes consumes like that it's how our world is now we just consume 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 finally we reach a tipping point and the caterpillar reaches a tipping point and goes into his cocoon he starts breaking down and that activates the imaginal cell it's actually biologically it's pronounced imaginal cell but we've changed it <laughs> in our, our metaphor to include the concept of imagination. So um, the imaginal cell uh, starts activating, but the caterpillar cell, the old way of doing things, uh, feels this new presence and feels threatened and starts attacking it and eating it and fighting against it. But that the imaginal cell starts, starts multiplying anyway and they find each other, they emit a common frequency, and they find each other and they start collaborating. And each, uh, the different cells actually have their own purpose. So some are the legs, some are the, the, the butterfly, some is the color, some, some are the mouth, some are the antennas. And so they, they, they collaborate and form 
slowly this butterfly and so out of this chaos that the caterpillar finally gives up and disappears and and because of this collaboration the beautiful butterfly emerges so for us the, that common frequency is the golden rule treat others and the planet as you wish to be treated so when enough of us collaborate we are able to overcome the old way of doing things and and have this new world that is more cooperative, more collaborative, more helpful, um, more supportive, and less exploitative, less extractive, um, less greedy. Um, so that that's that's the, the the beautiful metaphor from the book. I couldn't really tell you what is my favorite article because. Uh, I was just thrilled when I received them from our contributors. The first one I got was from Jonathan Porritt, which I find particularly beautiful. And I did, I did get tears in my eyes when I got that one. So it is very dear to my heart. And, um, but they all are, <laughs> really. And we, we continue to collaborate with a lot of our authors, which is really very exciting. In fact, I, I, I should mention that we are collaborating with jo Jonathan Porritt. He's uh, writing a new book geared towards young people. It's kind of a blue, it is a blueprint, um, as his previous books have been, for young people, what else they can do in addition to rising up, in fact, that's what we're calling it, rising, rise up, uh, what they can do in their communities locally and, and nationally uh, to, to and, and in a very short time span, we've, uh, uh, we've got till 2025 really to make some really important shifts in some of the pressures on, on the world. And then we're developing some teaching materials uh, because we have a, a, a another website called Global Dimension, which is a platform for educational materials that um, different organizations around the world produce to, to for teachers to download about the different issues of the world. So it quite, quite actually collaborates with our, fits in with our book. Uh, so this teaching material will be to encourage uh, people to, to follow this blueprint, I guess you could put it that way. Um, so th th this will, we'll be doing and rolling out in 2021. That's so. beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, um, and I, I, I'm sorry if I put you on the spot. It's always hard when you have to compete about so many fabulous uh, uh, people. The, the collaboration is, um, is good to hear that it's continuing on. I uh, am also uh, bringing out a book. It's called Menu B, People and Planet Food Saving Solutions. It's basically about global food reform, changing the food systems or improving them uh, drastically. And uh, also tons of contributors right now. Uh, the count is about 38 contributors, uh, fabulous people all over. And so if uh, I know you and Paul's passion is around food. So if you want to collaborate, if you want to join forces, I, I'll, I would love to, to have your voices as well. Um, we can talk about that offline, but uh, I, I, food is uh, definitely our passion. And it's also the biggest lever as uh, uh, Johan and Paul and many others, uh, what you said, um, to kind of get us back into the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries to draw down, like Paul Hawkins says as well, um, uh, our global warming and get us in, in a better situation. Not only is it the biggest effect on human suffering and, and environment, but it's also the biggest way to, to make a big impact and change. And it's such a beautiful cultural thing that we all do all the time especially with families and, and, and all around the world. And so I, I'm just really passionate about it as well. Um, and, and, and I've always been following you and Paul for many years, uh, not just because of the food, but because of that combination that you guys see uh, food and, and environment and sustainability tied together. Um, I, I have actually a few more not so difficult questions. I think I've, you're off the hook now. There's 
by the way, there's no wrong answer, so you can't get it wrong. We're just, I just want to get into the a little bit more in depth and substance. You uh, do the do a few things around the world, uh, as we talked about with those of, uh, who are blind or have vision problems. But you also came out not too long ago with uh, some kind of a, a planner, wall planner for, uh, is it curriculum or is it for uh, schools or education? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, the wall planner uh, was put out by our, uh, the, our team that focuses on education. Um, it's a big poster that teachers can use as a tool throughout the school year to help them um, focus on different issues of the world. So uh, it's most it's built a lot around the UN days. Day, you know, they, the UN has declared all kinds of days yeah. uh, for the environment or for girls or for, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. So uh, it points them to different tools uh, that they can use. Um, and uh, also, uh, this year's has different versions of golden rules that apply to each of them. It's the great thing about this, I keep harping on about the golden rule, but it is so flexible and um, adaptable. So it's very good uh, thing to date for people to keep in mind because, for example, if you want to be treated with dignity, then you can assume other people do as well. So then you should treat others with dignity. And if you want to, uh, if you want people to speak kindly to you, then you should also speak kindly to other people. You can assume other people like that as like that as well. Um, uh, you, you can think back on opportun on moments when somebody has not spoken kindly to you and been very brutal and. Uh, aggressive and you know who likes that right so we need to, to take that responsibility and be examples ourselves of speaking kindly um, you could go through all of those UN um, days if you if you uh, want to have if you are grateful for the education that you have or uh, had then you should make that education possible for others as well obviously there's all kinds you know the rape and you know all of the horrible horrible things the abuse the the, the low pay you know if you are happy to have a good salary then you should make sure the employees in your organization are paid a, an honest fair livable wage um, so it's it's just as basic as that um, that's beautiful. It's kind of like a reminder and a, a constant uh, rolling calendar to let them know what what's coming up, what's going on, what are the, the activities and momentums around and how can they educate and rally to, to get students and kids active in, in those areas or aware of what's going on. I love that. Yeah, the, the, any teacher can can uh, sign up and have we'll send copies on our website. Global yeah, great. I'll, I'm going to list uh, your websites and every anything we talk about in the show notes with some links so that people can go out and and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll catch a bunch of people who haven't read your book or didn't know about it that they'll go out and get a copy and uh, uh, From so, our websites, we, yeah. we, we don't have it on Amazon, but uh, yeah. on, from our website, rebootthefuture.org. Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be great. And um, here's a similar question that you've kind of already answered in, in one respect, but I'm going to put a different twist on it and see if the answer comes out any different. Um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Yeah, I agree with, with the Pope that um, uh, we need to have a kinder world. Um, a more thoughtful world and where where people do ask them the question you know what effect am i having on others and the planet the sdgs provide a really good framework 
for going in that direction because it's very specific. Um, the golden rule is the motivational principle, but the specifics are in the SDGs. So I think, uh, yeah, great worlds would be that, that the SDGs have been satisfied. My last three questions for you are really um, selfish for my listeners. They're um, takeaways that they could use or apply in their own lives. Um, and the first one is, if there was one message that you could depart to the listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? I'm going to have to repeat myself. Same thing, right? Treat others and the planet as you would wish to be treated. Great. What should young innovators um, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Well, I think uh, there's a lot of talk about having purpose. I find the idea of that word limiting. It needs an adjective in front of it good purpose because even a weapons producer has a purpose so think about your purpose. i personally don't think a weapons producer has a good purpose i don't want a gun ever aimed at me so why are we producing these kinds of weapons um these kinds of machines to kill one another so that's for me not a good purpose so the good purpose goes back to the common values that we, we talked about earlier, the respect and the dignity, the generosity, the kindness, you know, all of these things. And is there a way to embed this into your organization? Uh, and it doesn't really matter what you do. I mean, it does. <laughs> you want to have a, a good, a good product and a good uh, service that is helping, but the way you do it is as important as what you're doing. And when you're doing it in this good way and being a good person, you will do good things and you will be helpful rather than hurtful. So um, yeah, just uh, however you're building your organization, build these principles and there's a lot of really good examples so recently i i met um the, the woman who runs ground control in the uk they bought this organization in, in i can't recall 20 20 or 25 years ago and it was just a simple ground maintenance company but they have embedded so many beautiful principles into it so they profit share they provide a lot of mental health services. They do everything. All of their products are ecological. Um, they really encourage education, continuing education for all, all staff. They have a core um, employees, but then they do a lot of, they have a lot of contractors, but they continue to train those contractors they continue to support them and they they don't just dismiss them you know it, it's it they encourage them to be successful as a contractor um not just dependent on them but also with others and it, it's a very holistic very beautiful example of how the golden rule is embedded in their entire organization they don't use those words but the, the principles are, are there and so deeply embedded in everything they do so there are examples out there that an innovator can look at and um, model so again the b certification system is another um, way of of embedding uh, those principles and it's great it's better to start from the beginning with those principles rather than creating something becoming successful and then adding it into it successful financially because you might not be successful in terms of how you're treating your employees 
So, so build it in from the beginning and you will be more resilient. You will be more creative and innovative and adaptable uh, if, if you have those at the very core of your organization. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I say a lot in, in my talks and, and writings is that it's really not about the brands or the products of the future that will have the biggest impact on human health and human suffering and our, our environment, greenhouse gas emissions and some of the pollutions that we're, we're having uh, based around products, uh, whether it's single use or, or whatever it is. Um, it's how we produce those products that matters the most. And that goes back to what I was mentioning about air travel. There's a way to do it that's bad and harmful for human health and the environment. And there's a way that should be in the future that doesn't have that impact and that harm. Uh, and that is applicable to all brands and products and the way we do things that uh, also has a little bit of that, that golden rule in there um, and the resiliency in there. If you were to do something uh, in the depths of outer space to produce something there that was wasteful on en energy and used a lot of chemicals in a closed system, in, in minutes to no longer than hours, you would quickly realize that you've just polluted or hurt yourself and you've created a product that that has a ripple effect or, or an effect on that closed environment. Whereas if we look at doing things differently, innovative uh, with purpose, without harm on human health and the environment and without uh, um, these impacts within the planetary boundaries, within our finite resources, it really um, can be a game changer, but it's a mind shift on how we look at that. And that, uh, that's how, this, uh, for me, what I kind of heard a little bit of the summation of what, what you mentioned there. Yeah, one, um, I, I want to share a bad example. Okay. And that's in the book. Uh, it's, the, it's about the ocean fat vessel, the ocean fishing vessel that has this huge net that it's a, a kilometer long net that drags Either it just catches everything as it's floating along, absolutely everything, or it's dragging along the bottom and destroying the entire ecosystem on the bottom. So this story is just so shocking and these ships are still out there. Uh, so my, my question is, if you are an investor, it's, it's about how we're all responsible. So if you are an investor, you should not be investing in this kind of fishing vessel. Secondly, if you are a designer of nets, you should not be designing a net like that. And then thirdly, if you are a consumer of fish, it's very hard to get that information, but try your best to not buy fish that have been fished in this way. It's, I, I, when I read that story, I, I've thought about a helicopter, a giant helicopter going through my village or my town and just having this huge net drag along, pick everything up, all the houses and all the people and the lampposts and the cars and everything. And then wanting to take out a few red cars to keep. And every, then everything else gets thrown back down, destroyed. Like we would, we would be protesting against that. Yeah, exactly. We'd be fighting wars about that. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever yeah. did that. So why? What gives us the right to do that in the ocean? Yeah. It's astonishing to me, and it's the egoism of the human being that thinks that we're we're superior and that that the world is there for us to exploit and extract from without protecting and giving back and long-term you know existence so i that that is that's again, a beautiful story i like that as well and i've yeah. I worked on some projects that really are combating that and trying to solve those problems and change the fishing industry matter of fact more than one project three different projects um, around the world what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far, your life, that you would have loved to know 
from the start. Hmm. Keep going and don't get discouraged and um, find, find the people that you admire and look up to either read, uh, read their books or if you can uh, get to know them better, ask them for advice. Um, yeah, I think having the courage to, to choose the right way of doing things and not go along with what the system, how the system is behaving. I think having courage to go against the system would be a good thing. I love that. I, I really, I think part of the process is a journey for myself. So I like the journey, but if I, if I, I were to answer that same question, I would say, darn, I, I wish I would have started sooner. I just wish I would have started sooner. I more impact and more yeah. movement if I had only started sooner. So that, that's the only thing that I probably would add, but I, I, I really appreciate our time here together. Uh, and unless there's anything else you would like to add or ask me, uh, that's all the questions I had for you. And it's been a sheer pleasure. Well, it's been a pleasure for me too. And I'm, again, I'm greatly honored that you asked me and invited me onto your podcast. And I, I hope it's helpful. It was beautiful. Thank you so much, Kim. And uh, tell Paul hello. And uh, hopefully you'll see your kids soon. And I wish you all the best in this holiday season and the upcoming new year. And hope that we can follow up again next year and have a little bit deeper discussion of what you've done and, and uh, what's progressing for you and your family. Yeah, and I, I think uh, since January is the month of, of New Year's resolutions, uh, I hope everybody will embrace the golden rule and make it their New, new Year's resolution. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. I really appreciate it.